The Unshackled Waves, Episode 70. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms here for this week's review episode and I'm joined once again by my co-editor-in-chief of The Unshackled, Sukha Fernando. Welcome again. Thanks, Tim, and hello, everyone. Uh, now, just a bit of news about the podcast. So episodes will be posted uh, less frequently over the next few weeks. That's because we're getting uh, a new studio fitted uh, here at my place. As you can see, if you're watching the video version, you can see I've got a different uh, backdrop. So that'll be done in the next few weeks, which is why in this podcast episode, you can hear an echo but that will be fixed, I assure you. And it's also because we're working on some uh, big projects for The Unshackled, which means that uh, we're trying to juggle many things at once, but uh, they're very important for The Unshackled going forward. So uh, we're excited, but we've got to make some sacrifices as well, don't we, Sukath? We do, yeah. I mean, we need to expand. So that'll take some, it'll make things a bit more, you know, uh, delayed sometimes. Yeah. But watch this space, there's some big news coming up. Yeah. Uh, The news for this week, uh, it's been a somewhat of a crisis for conservatism in Australia. So this started uh, nearly a fortnight ago with the release of the Pine Tapes where he bragged about the moderates were now running the Liberal Party. And of course that led to the Liberal Party infighting between uh, Malcolm Turnbull and Tony Abbott. Then on the weekend, we learned that Liberal Senator Dean Smith was announcing he was going to be proposing a same-sex marriage bill in the Senate to uh, bypass the, the coalition's promise policy of holding a plebiscite on the issue. And then there was Turnbull's speech over in the United Kingdom where he accepted an award for Australia having a non-discriminatory immigration policy where he claimed that the Liberal Party was called uh, the Liberal Party, not the Conservative Party, uh, for a reason. And so that's uh, caused a lot of t- uh, tension back home with, was that an attack on uh, Tony Abbott? And Corey Bernardi and Pauline Hanson have used uh, Turnbull's speech to promote their, their own party, saying come to the true Conservative Party. Over in the United States, uh, Donald Trump finally met Vladimir Putin. Uh, They appeared to have a good meeting. They discussed working together on Syria and also cyber security. Uh, which now because this meeting went well the neocons at home were quite triggered and they're like how dare Trump think about working with the, the Russians about cyber security because remember uh, you know they they hacked the election and that's what we're always told to swallow um, so this proves that even though Trump he does want to work with Russia it's still politically difficult for him at home and uh, also later in the week it was revealed that Donald Trump Jr he had a meeting uh, roughly a year ago with a Russian lawyer who had links with the Kremlin who promised incriminating information on Hillary Clinton. Meanwhile uh, CNN continues to become more unhinged after that uh, video was po- uh, posted by Trump showing him beating up the CNN logo. They threatened to dox the person who created the video or the GIF, I should say. What I mean by doxing is reveal uh, his identity. The internet has responded by declaring a meme war on CNN. And so some of their own reporters have got doxed and it's clear that, that now you can't really consider them a proper news organization. They've just descended into uh, insanity if I can use that term. But let's talk about the crisis of Australian conservatism. Now, we've published a few articles on this uh, this week's Sue Earth. Uh, you published one, another author of ours, Lance Thomas, published one. Uh, do you want to start about what's your interpretation of what Turnbull said? Um, well, I just think that you know, Turnbull is trying to, um, you know, to, try to open up about his agenda to to have the Liberal Party go further to the left. I think he's trying to sort of um, say that the Liberal Party wasn't founded on conservatism. It was founded on this mission to progress and this mission to sort of, um, you know, become more 
left wing in in one way or another. And I think he's trying to use that to you know, justify his, um, you know, sort of plans for the party to become more left wing. And we have seen that through his. Uh, well, first we thought, saw that through his, you know, plans to have um, you know, the climate change policy, because then we saw how he tried to. Well, various left wing things that I could keep on mentioning, um, but you know that was the first revelation that he was going to take the party leftwards. But then now he's made this explicit statement that you know he it's his plan to not just take the party leftwards, but to sort of manipulate its history and its foundation and say that you know um, Robert Menzies founded this on you know on progressivism. He's now founded this on conservatism. Uh, so therefore, it's my plan to sort of make this more left wing, and I think that's what he's trying to do. There has been uh, so, uh, some commentators uh, back here in Australia and also uh, some Conservative MPs have said that this is a, a beat-up because uh, if you look at Turnbull's speech closely, he said that the Liberal Party it, it takes from both the classical Liberal tradition and the uh, Conservative uh, tradition and that's what Menzies intended and he said that uh, being in the sensible set centre, that's something that Tony Abbott said as well. And so there actually hasn't been any uh, conservative criticism of him in the Liberal Party. Um, even Erica Betts defended what Malcolm yeah. Turnbull said. So um, there, there is this accusation that people like us are, you know, cre are creating, trying to create something out of nothing. Well, I don't think we are because, you know, he what he's practically saying is that he wants to have the little party to be on the center. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't work. And I know that Erica Betts, um, you know, has said, you know, has actually, you know, celebrated or complimented um, Malcolm Turnbull and his statements. But I think it probably is him trying to, or it probably is a plan within the party to make sure that they appear united. Um, because, you know, as we know, as we know, um, the, the division within the party um, is a big, a huge obstacle for how, you know, it, it, for a huge obstacle for its ability to win the next election. So, that, so therefore, maybe Erica Betts is trying to sort of show that the party is united. Um, but I don't think we are making a well, I don't think we are, you know, misunderstanding or misrepresenting what Malcolm Turnbull is doing. We know what he's doing. He's trying to make the party more left wing. We know that his associates like Christopher Pine and George Brandis, who are left wing, um, who are associated with the left wing club in the Liberal Party, the Black Hand, um, they want to use their friends in Canberra to, you know, somehow have a vote in Parliament about same-sex marriage by subverting, you know, the, the promise to give the people a democratic opportunity. So I think, you know, this is, this just supports the fact that Turnbull is trying to take the party leftwards. Uh, and by saying that, you know, we are in the center, you know, he's practically saying that we are in the left because today center in many ways is left wing. And I noticed that Tony Abbott uh, didn't uh, say anything uh, in response as well. Maybe that's because he's sort of thought that, you know, I've said my bit, uh, yeah. maybe I should just be quiet for a while, or he's just uh, watching Turnbull here, you know, get himself into uh, a hole, because there have been, uh, Jeff Kennett, for example, has said, like, even if this speech wasn't intended to cause tension, like with the current uh, infighting in the Liberal Party, why would you make it when you know that it's going to be interpreted as that? So clearly, like Turnbull, he, he didn't get the, the memo that maybe you should tread lightly about this sort of stuff. He didn't, yeah, I think, I don't, I, he probably doesn't want to tread lightly. He probably wants to um, somehow, you know, he, I think he's trying to use this as a test, as some sort of you know, experiment to see what's going to happen. And he's slowly, gradually trying to expose his agenda by saying that, you know, we are now centrist, which practically means we are now left wing. Um, so, you know, and he wants to see what the backlash is going to be. And the backlash, um, I guess it hasn't been as bad as you mentioned, because, you know, we have seen many conservatives who are not just criticizing, who are criticizing us, you know, they're not criticizing Malcolm Tilbury, they're cr criticizing us for saying that we are making a big deal out of it. So I think he, it's gone his way. I think he's done something smart um, in many ways. And it's it has gone his way because no one is criticizing him much um, in parliament. So, you know, I, I just think it's scary to see that he's trying to manipulate the party's history. I mean, Robert Menzies was someone who who supported the white Australia policy. He supported um, the monarchy. He's a monarchy. He was a staunch monarchist. Um, so how could someone like that, you know, how could you say that someone like that Founded a party that was to be meant that was meant to be centrist or meant to be progressive. You know, no, it was meant to be conservative and classical liberal, which in many ways is conservative these days. Um, so, yeah, I just think it's quite it's quite crazy to say that 
that sort of person would found a centrist party when he clearly did. But let's uh, focus on, you know, what Menzies would have meant by combining conservative and classical liberal. Like, classical liberalism doesn't mean, you know, it's, uh, you know, socially progressive, you know, all of this uh, degenerate uh, sort of stuff. Classical liberalism means uh, not just conserving the past, but also having, uh, you know, personal responsibility, individual liberty and free markets. I think that's what Menzies meant by combining liberalism and yeah. conservatism. And if you look at the two most successful leaders of the Liberal Party, uh, Menzies and John Howard, they've both been primarily conservative and uh, free market, although Menzies was to yeah. a degree a protectionist. Yeah, um, you know, that that's the crux, you know, he said you know, the party was founded on conservatism and classical liberalism. Now, I understand there are many people who do think that classical liberalism sort of created um, a slippery slope, you know, the, the slippery slope thing is very popular these days. So people are saying that modern liberalism is, you know, the logical progression of classical liberalism because you know liberalism was founded in the in the first place and then now it became this it became that just like first wave feminism then became you know second wave third wave so i get that but you know classical liberalism on its own is still very conservative you know they still they are, they are social conservative many of them are personally social conservative many of them however um politically um a bit more you know a bit more libertarian in a sense you know they they would they may support a um, marriage privatization over you know keeping the traditional marriage or supporting same sex marriage they might support private in that sense. Um, and economically, of course, classical liberals tend to be more free market. Conservatives do tend to be a bit more, um, well, they may be a bit more protectionist in, in, in some ways, like Burkean conservatives, for example, or paleo conservatives. Um, so, in that, so the point is classical liberalism is, you know, very conservative in, in, in a way. And today it is conservative today, considering how modern liberalism is different. Um, and I know that Robert Benzies, he, he, did, he was very supportive of the arrival of foreign capital to Australia. He was very supportive of um, foreign investment. Um, he may have been protectionist, he may have supported the white Australia policy, I know that. But in many ways, he did support the arrival of foreign investment from countries that can be trusted, not China, but countries like the United States, um, other European countries that can be trusted. Um, so that in that in that way, you know, he was free market. But Malcolm Turnbull has misunderstood that or he's purposely trying to manipulate it or both um, and say that, you know, since it was found on classical liberalism, it must mean he must be, you know, progressive. It must mean he must be um, a centrist. So therefore, we must make sure our party is now centrist. When that does not make sense, you know, it's if anything, it's center right, not centrist. You know, center right is as centrist as the Liberal Party should go. Um, and Malcolm Turnbull, however, since he is a leftist, he's left libertarian. He wants to make the party go more to the left. And I know there are lots of liberal voters who do want to see that. There are lots of liberals who are, you know, free market, but they do, they are not socially conservative and they want to convert the Liberal Party into a progressive party that is still a free market. How do I know? I used to be one of them. When I, when I was when I was younger, I used to be one of them. So in, in that sense, I do understand that lots of people, I know lots of people who do want to convert the Liberal Party into a socially progressive, yet, you know, economically conservative party, and that's their agenda. And you know, I've seen many of them in, at universities as well who vote liberal, but they are feminists. Um, so I think, I think that's that agenda sort of sweeping into the, to the party. Yeah, and it's, uh, let's not forget where Malcolm Turnbull made this speech. It was accepting what was called the uh, Disraeli Prize uh, we, uh, yeah. for uh, Australia's non-discriminatory immigration policy. Uh, so basically, it's an award for open borders. And it was given by an allegedly conservative think tank called the Policy Exchange, was given to him by uh, the current Home Secretary, Amber Rudd, uh, because uh, apparently, you know, like uh, uh, open borders and cultural enrichment's been so good for the the UK uh, that we're seeing this year, and, and so the yeah, like just looking at the setting of where he gave his speech and that he accepted this award, given that Australians back home are very concerned about not just the uh, Islamization of Australia, but you know, immigration from the Middle East and Africa generally. I mean. Uh, this just shows that Turnbull is out of touch with definitely conservative values. 
Well, uh, firstly, it shows that you know Britain itself is not going anywhere since that conservative government is having these award ceremonies for open borders. Um, so should, yeah, you know, yeah. it just shows. They should be called the Liberal Party, the Conservative Party in the UK. Exactly, should be. They should be. I mean, they they are in fact much more liberal um, than our Liberal Party in many ways. Um, so, so first of there's that they have their problems and their Conservatives aren't doing anything about it. Um, and second, you know, as it said, it just shows it's just a symbol. You know, it's an expression of the fact that Turnbull is completely out of touch with ordinary Australians because here he is receiving an award which I think he deserves in many ways because he did he is like that you know he receives an award um, for having open borders for for ha having this you know open you know very welcoming migration policy that's going to result in such cultural enrichment it, I mean it resulted in such cultural enrichment that you know women in the Gold Coast got sexually assaulted by an Afghan refugee teen I mean that's the sort of enrichment we are facing right now um, and he is receiving an award again you know just goes to show that this prime minister is out of touch and you know he probably isn't going to do anything about um our migration crisis since he is on his way to try and make the liberal party more left-wing and it's not just the the speech itself which like sent people uh, or i wouldn't say would made us uh you know uncomfortable with where turnbull is going it's the the whole package of the accumulation of what's happened over the past few weeks, obviously, with, you know, uh, as I said at the beginning, Christopher Pine and George Brandes, you know, uh, saying triumphantly, you know, uh, us moderates, or that's what they call themselves, but they are leftists and now in charge of the party. And of course, uh, Dean Smith, who actually himself claims to be a conservative, uh, proposing a same sex marriage bill to. Uh, uh, basically get the coalition to break its election, election commitment to hold a plebiscite on the issue. The thing that really uh, got me, annoyed me about Dean Smith, and uh, this is also the same with Pine and Brandis, he is, yeah, that he, when, when he first got uh, got pre-selected to go into the, the, the Senate, he, yeah, he claimed to be a conservative and said he was against same-sex marriage, but then all of a sudden he had an epiphany and said, oh, I believe it now, and now he's like one of the biggest proponents of it, like he voted against the initial plebiscite legislation. Uh, and so it's, it just makes you wonder, like, how, how many of these uh, fake conservatives are in the in the Liberal Party who say that, oh, you know, we can be uh, trusted to, you know, do the right thing by conservatives, yet uh, are behaving like this? Yeah, I think it's funny because it's, it was the Liberals who blamed Labour for sort of going back on their stance on same-sex marriage. Because I know Penny Wong used to be against it, um, Jula Gillard used to be against it, but now look at them. You know, they are completely for same-sex marriage, and they are, you know, they are blasting the Liberals for having this, this homophobic plebiscite. Um, but Liberals are the ones who are using that against them, but it turns out that many of their Conservatives who are against it are now for it. You know, and you know they've changed their mind based on the most superficial circumstances. I mean, if, uh, it was Chris uh, Dean Smith found out that it was the 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 Lynn Cafe siege, um, the Lynn Cafe um, siege in Sydney. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the one, one of the one of the heroes of that was was a gay man, you know, and he said that he felt sad that someone like him wasn't able to marry and... It's also him. worth pointing out that Dean Smith himself is gay, so sort of that probably comes okay. into the equation yeah. as well. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I understand that he... Of course he would feel sad that, you know, a, a, a man would die. That's obviously, I mean, in the Link Cafe siege, for example. Um, but... That doesn't mean you know you use that in a in a, in a in a in a superficial way and sort of try and you know transfer that to a completely different issue, um, you know that, that that that's not how it works. Okay, you know, and I think he's and you mentioned this in your article in, in your analysis. I think you know he, he he it does seem like he was exploiting he was exploiting and taking it to his own advantage that particular event and then using it to say hey look I've changed my mind because of this I have a reason now so you can't judge me um, therefore here, here I am you know he, he's who I am he's who I, was, who I always was I was just hiding my, my, my actual views behind my false charade of conservatism and he's done it you know he's, he's, used, that, he's used that event for his advantage and now he supports same-sex marriage um, you know again it's just an 
you know, ultimately is an example of how all these progressives are infiltrating the party um, and, you know, trying to take over and make it more progressive and try to fit their sort of warped outlook, you know, this warped outlook where people are now economically conservative but socially progressive um, and they're trying to make the party into that sort of party and it's a party that suffers ultimately. Uh, and so there's a debate now whether conservatives are welcome in the Liberal Party anymore. We've published two articles on the Unshackled, one saying, you know, stay in the Liberal Party and, and, and fight back. And there is a, yeah. a fight back effort currently going on uh, in Victoria. And I know that um, they're, they're trying to do the same in New South Wales. But we've also published another article which uh, looks at the minor parties and how they might be the better alternative. Because obviously, uh, One Nation is currently riding high. And obviously, uh, Australian Conservatives, uh, Corey Bernardi said they've already got around 10,000 members and Bernardi has said himself that he's doing what Menzies did when he founded the Liberal Party because uh, before Menzies founded the Liberal Party there was the United Australia Party which was falling apart and so he, he said he's not trying to compare himself with Menzies, Corey Bernardi but he says he's realising that it's a, a time for a new party to rise uh, on the right. I'm of the, the view that I think the minor parties are the, the way to go. I mean uh, Liberal Party will always be too weak to do anything. I mean, the, the pre uh, candidates who get pre-selected, most of them will say like, oh yeah, I'm like so on board with all these things. But once they, they get into power, it's like, oh, but we've got to balance all of these, you know, you know interest groups and uh, oh, we can't do anything too con uh, controversial. Uh, you know, we can't like upset these people. And, and it's just like, you know, uh, what's the point? Yeah, I think I think I, I would sort of look at it in, in more of a middle path sort of perspective by saying that, you know, I do think that minor parties are the future for now, at least, at least for now in the minor, minor parties are the future. Um, and I think they are able to appeal to Austra Australian people more than the Liberal Party is. Um, I know that there are if you get there are some views um, like Lance Thomas um, wrote in that article that, you know, that that you know, it doesn't matter how many minor parties there are, they will only end up getting two Senate seats and the Liberals will always secure um, the most seats in, as, as a right-wing, as a centre-right or, or, or supposedly centre-right, whatever party. Um, and that, you know, because that's because people will always continue to choose the Liberals than some minor party who's been made up, you know, since recently. Um, I don't know. I don't think that's the case because people are more loyal to the cause and more loyal to the country than they are to the party. So, you know, it's not like I think they would vote for the party that would um, sort of fulfill their views rather than vote for, you know, a party that they have been loyal to um, because what matters, you know, what matters is the cause and the party comes afterwards. Um, so I do, I do think the minor parties are the way. However, I do think that we sh should remain, you know, um, we should remain involved with um, or remain focused on the Liberal Party as along, along with supporting the minor parties because, you know, maybe in the future the Liberal Party might change. But as you mentioned, right now there is no, there is no such direction because they have fallen to political correctness. The party is a sinking boat um, and you know, they, they will continue to attract people who are career politicians um, who will say anything to get in. And when they do get in, like Dean Smith, they change their mind. They use some situation and they change their mind. Um, and the Liberal Party is susceptible to that. Maybe that's not their plan. Maybe they're trying to avoid that but it's susceptible to that um, because it is a very large major party and that's how the culture is right now so I think and I think minor parties like One Nation and Australian Conservatives are much more immune to that sort of problem um, and they're able to take people not because um, you know, not because uh, because people want the money, but because you know people have the actual the actual views and they want to enact change um, so I think in that sense you know the minor parties are the way to go right now. If the, if the Liberal Party announced that they were going to propose a policy to ban uh, Muslim immigration, then I would definitely say, yep, you know, the Liberal Party is definitely yeah. the, the way to go. But I will always prefer, yeah. as long as the Liberal Party is a major party, I'll always prefer them over the Labor Party and will want them to oh. uh, be, be the party yeah. that forms government. I'm, uh, I'm not, like, uh, even though, even if I, like, voted for minor parties, I'd still, you know, make sure I preference the Liberals over the Labor Party. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, 
unless the liberals become more left wing than Labour, unless that happens, I will always prefer liberals over Labour. That's that's for sure. Okay, so let's turn overseas now. So Donald Trump finally met uh, Vladimir Putin uh, over at the uh, G20, uh, which was in uh, Hamburg, which we saw, um, it was quite ironic, the, the protesters outside, they described themselves as anti-globalist, yet the United States president is the most anti-globalist uh, yeah. pers- uh, elected official in the world. And... I made the, the point, I didn't uh, put it in an article I wrote on Facebook, that I wonder if the French protesters, uh, I wonder if they voted for the globalist Macron or the, the nationalist uh, Le Pen. Yeah, that's, that's true, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so the, the protesters were the, the sideshow, but, yeah, it was the, the meeting between, yeah, Trump and Putin, uh, which was the main talking point. So it was scheduled to go for only half an hour, the meeting, but it ended up going for two hours, and they both said that they had a, a good meeting. So, yeah, they discussed um, trying to find a peaceful solution to Syria and working together on uh, cyber security, and Putin said that um, Trump... Uh, believed him when he said that Russia didn't interfere in the election, which there is still no proof of. Like, there's still not a single uh, shred of evidence, Like even though, like James Comey said, oh, there's no doubt in my mind, still no uh, concrete proof. And, it's, and yes, uh, Trump, before he went into the meeting, said that oh, it could have been Russia, it could have been a lot of people. So, uh, you know, it's clear that, you know, he, Trump, you know, is trying not to buy into it as well. So it was good that despite, you know, all of this pressure on Trump to, you know, like beat up on Russia, they were still, you know, face to face, you know, uh, were able to, you know, work out uh, ways to cooperate. Yeah, I think uh, Trump, ha- he, he, it's his plan to try and cooperate with Russia and prevent any conflicts with them. You know, we know that one major reason we avoided supporting Hillary Clinton was because she wanted to practically have a war with him or she, her actions would have resulted in a huge conflict and it wouldn't have been a cold war, it would have been an actual war with Russia. Um, and this, you know, this meeting, I think, reflected that. It, it, you know, you, can, you, you could tell, you, you could compare Obama's meeting with with Putin and Trump's meeting with Putin, um, and Trump was, you know, much much more hospitable. They talked much better, um, and you know, it showed that they were genuinely, you know, willing and motivated to try and cooperate with regards to Syria, with regards to um, many problems in the Middle East. Um, and we know that already that you know, ISIS is on, is about to lose, um, you know, and that's thanks to both Russia and the, and America. So I think you know, it just shows that Trump and Trump and Putin are ready to cooperate, and it's a good thing um, because you know, despite all the evidence, it's funny because the evidence today, for example, they used was how Trump met with these particular individuals, had dinner with them. You know, it's it's very superficial evidence. It's not like they have any actual proof of Trump's words, like we have with Hillary's words with WikiLeaks. We know what Hillary actually said um, when she was talking to particular people or she knew of particular secrets or whatever. Um, But these were just superficial evidence based on how Trump was meeting with with these random people connected with Russia. Um, And, you know, just that doesn't mean anything, obviously. But, you know, CNN, the ratings are good and they're trying to expand on this. Um, But it's it's nice to see that they're cooperating. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, a CNN producer confessed that the yeah. uh, Russian narrative was fake and they were pushing it for ratings. Van Jones says it was a big nothing burger. And then there was yeah. another video where uh, another CNN producer said that American voters are stupid as shit. Uh, so, uh, so, so it's clear that, you know, the, this Russia stuff is is fake news but the mainstream media they thought that they had the smoking gun when it was uh, revealed that uh, by the new york new york times i believe uh that donald trump jr uh met with a a russian attorney this time uh last year um uh, the meeting was under the guise that he that they would have incriminating uh information on hillary clinton so trump jr met with him uh thought that there there wasn't much to the the material that was given to him and that and that was pretty pretty much it um uh, but apparently like the, uh, this is actually like the closest thing that 
the the only real evidence that would suggest there's any type of collusion i mean that that's why i called it the smoking gun if this is a smoking gun then like if they actually found like real evidence like it would explode a house to use that that analogy so trump jr he um he released the the email chain uh meeting with the um uh, russian attorney uh so you know he made sure that he was transparent and with an interview with uh hannity uh i would have been an, a night ago now said that you know this meeting took place before you know the the russia conspiracy was being pushed because let's remember it was just after he clinched the the nomination this was before you know like it was russia 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 um and uh, i have to agree that um it was pretty clumsy of trump jr to um to to have this meeting um uh, I understand why he didn't disclose it because he, he was damned if he did and damned if he didn't because if he disclosed it then like the media would so I understand why he tried to make sure that uh, information didn't come out about that but yeah if this is the best the mainstream media can do like that just shows the case uh, for the Russian interference is way and Trump collusion is way for thin. Yeah, I mean, if this is just the evidence they have, yeah, again, it just shows that they don't have any real evidence. You know, they're just using some random meeting between Trump Jr. and um, the Russian lawyer. Um, the thing is, you know, I I do think it was bad PR for Trump Jr. to do to do that. You know, maybe he should have thought better. But I don't, I I personally don't see anything wrong with him trying to um, find out information regarding Hillary Clinton. I mean, let's remember that Hillary Clinton is in many ways an evil person. I mean, she is a a corrupt, you know, warmonger um, who took funding took funding from countries that, you know, um, were against the people who she pretended to support. Um, and you know, it's it's it. I think it's it's okay. It's more than okay for Trump to to get more information about someone like that. Um, and I, I'm I'm glad he released those emails on Twitter because it shows that he's transparent. And it didn't take an, a different organization to release it for him like they did with Hillary Clinton. Um, so I think. I, I just don't see anything wrong with, you know, him going off and trying to find information about him exactly. Uh, the former vice presidential uh, nominee for the Democrats, Tim Kaine, said that the meeting was uh, treasonous and Democratic congressmen have already drafted articles of impeachment. So it's clear they've seized upon this and like, yes, this is the smoking gun. Now we can finally take down uh, Trump. Uh, uh, but it just, yeah, as, as I said, it just goes to show how, how weak the, the case is. And of course, going back to the Trump-Putin uh, meeting, uh, there was, yeah, obviously the triggered neocons at home who said, like, working with Russia with cybersecurity, why don't we just give, uh, give the Russians our voter ID information? And, like, Lindsey Graham was like, oh, I wouldn't want to work with uh, Russia with anything. So it's still, like, because Trump's got to fight this, Russia collusion thing, but he's also trying to do the right thing by America and dare I say it, uh, the world by having the United States and Russia uh, work together, but it's just so politically difficult. It is. You know, the, I, ca I actually can't believe that there are people who are saying that you know we need to, um, you know, that we, we need to not have any relationship with Russia. That we need to continue having a conflict with them. Um, and the problem is with Trump. For Trump, is that when it comes to foreign policy and when it comes to attitudes towards Russia, you know, the Republicans and Democrats are one party. And it's all one party, um, and they're united against Russia in their in their foreign policy. And I think that is a huge problem that Trump faces. Um, Hopefully he can do something about it. You know, there is no evidence. People don't believe in this Russia conspiracy, um, as we saw with the Project Veritas video. Um, it, it helped us. It gave us more evidence that you know it's all completely fake, and that CNN really is fake news. And that if you don't believe that, then you're probably um, quite special because the proof was right before your eyes. Um, but you know, I, I just hope we can somehow you know sort of battle out with these neocons. Um, and maybe you know try and actually cooperate with Russia, and I think he's doing well with regards to that front. Well, let's talk about uh, CNN in more detail now. Uh, what's being termed the CNN meme war because they they were quite triggered that uh, Trump uh, tweeted this video of him fighting the the CNN logo, and so uh, one of their journalists uh, hunted down the 
it wasn't the creator of the video, but the creator of the GIF, which apparently was turned into a video. It was a Reddit uh, user whose uh, name escapes me. It was it was it was something rude. Uh, so they threatened to uh, dox uh, the person who uh, created it, and uh, unless he apologised and promised not to do you know anything horrible like this again. And this is like highly unethical for a news organization to basically say, you know, we're going to try and ruin your life if you don't, you know, say sorry to us. So uh, basically CNN was quite naive to think that they could, you know, just get away with this because CNN in their article saying we found out his identity say, said that, uh, you know, although they've said they're very sorry, CNN reserves the right to publish uh, their, uh, their identity should any of that change. And so... The internet's just declared war on them now, and so there's now everyone's making uh, CNN memes. And uh, uh, I know that uh, Alex Jones, Infowars, they've offered a twenty thousand dollar prize for the best uh, CNN meme. Uh, so clearly, CNN uh, they've just further discredited themselves. And yeah, it's I, I've. Uh, like we we saw those Project Veritas videos where you know they think that Americans are, are stupid and they're carrying on like nothing had happened. Like they're still spreading fake news, and it's like, are you are, yeah. you, are you ever going to address the whole internet at war with you now because of your stupid actions? Yeah, I think they. It, I find it quite hilarious how they have the nerve to continue going on with this Russia, um, this Russia news, this Russia conspiracy when they have been, you know, revealed, they have been exposed, um, for who they are. They, they, you know, Project Russia has showed us, exposed CNN, and showed us that they really are the very fake news, that they are the very fraud news network, um, and here they are continuing to, you know, push out this Russia news, um, and you know they've gone so far as to do something try and ruin someone's life you know it's it's a teenager um and they're gonna you know they're gonna expose everything about him and you know they're not gonna consider all the actual impact it will have on his life um because they really are an unethical evil news network and you know it just shows that they are ready to um commit these unethical acts to get there to get to, to achieve their goals it's funny because they accuse they accuse trump supporters of being machiavellian you know they're you know we will do anything to achieve our goals but they are the ones who are machiavellian because they are the ones who are prepared to ruin someone's life to achieve their goals yeah, and, and of course the the internet they also responded by publishing the home addresses of several CNN reporters and the yeah. reporter who initially found out this uh, 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 Reddit user's identity uh, complained about you know him and his wife getting you know harassing and threatening phone calls and it's like boohoo you threatened to let ruin someone's life like I'm glad you're getting all these threats like it's what you deserve. And, and that, that is karma. I mean that is karma. I mean, you prepared. I mean. The same thing and worse would have happened to that person, um, who to that, to that teenager who made it. Um, if you released there, you know, it would have been much worse because you know he's just a normal person. He's not a big CEO or he's not a big figure in some company. Um, and you're going through that, you know, you know, if you're gonna, you know, if you're gonna do the same thing to others and be prepared to sort of hand, go through that same thing by yourself because you know karma will get you ultimately. It makes you wonder, like, is there anyone of actual any intelligence working at CNN if they thought that, you know, this was the right way to react to, you know, a harmless video of, you know, Trump, uh, you know, beating up a CNN logo? I mean, you know, it's clear that CNN, they can dish it out, but they, they can't take it. Like, how do you criticise us? You know, right, we're going to get to the bottom of this. I mean, imagine, like, uh, they, they could have actually reported some real news instead of sending one of their reporters out to, you know, troll through the internet to see if they could find out who this, you know, shit poster was. Yeah, I think it just shows that, you know, it's the propaganda. They're, they're there as a propaganda outlet. They're not there as a news organization. They're there to, you know, somehow somehow destabilize the Trump administration and, you know, continue on with fulfilling their own agenda because that's, that's, that is their goal. Um, and the fact that they, are, they continue focusing on this uh, and the fact that people continue believing on that despite the Project Right House video um, just shows that, you know, they are able to exist because of the stupidity that is present among the left in in America and the world. 
Oh uh, yeah, they're back, back pushing the, uh, the the Trump Russia narrative like just uh, just in the past week, like yeah, carrying on like nothing yeah. and nothing had happened, like they hadn't been dis completely yeah, exactly. discredited as a news organization. And yes, it's true that they do think that, or well, their viewers at least, are stupid, and, and that they'll just you know watch CNN and believe everything. Yeah, I mean, and the thing is, there are many lefties who are like that. I, I keep seeing comments. Um, I saw I I I continue I continue seeing right wing people, you know, taking over the comment section and saying that we know you're fake news. We saw the video. Um, and you just just stop doing it. You're you know you're embarrassing yourself. But I I continue to see lefties who are saying you know the Russia conspiracy is real. Um, they probably haven't seen the video um themselves. So you know again just show, shows that the stupidity rampant among America's left is continuing to fuel CNN's presence. Um, and also you know. CNN just thinks that voters are stupid. Many of them are, and I think those are the people who are giving them the ratings. Um, and the fact that people are switching from CNN and mainstream sources to alternative sources, and it is is shown by how CNN is is reducing or having a, a CNN's rates ratings are hit, and you know how alternative news media is having higher ratings now, um, thanks to these shenanigans by mainstream media. Uh, I've, I've looked forward to the day when yeah, CNN completely collapses. Hopefully, uh, we at the Unshackled can play a part in that. Yeah, I hope we're going to re replace that too. Well, that's all we've got time for this week. So thank you once again for being my co-host, Sukath. It was my pleasure. And I, of course, would encourage all of our listeners to, if you haven't already, sign up to the email list at theunshackled.net slash subscribe. Please consider supporting The Unshackled by becoming a patron on Patreon. We've arranged some awesome benefits for those who uh, wish to support us. And don't forget there's Unshackled merchandise on sale at uprightmarket.com. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. You can do so on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or view the video version on YouTube. And of course, don't forget to keep checking theunshackled.net on a regular basis for all the latest news. Thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time.